It's okay. That's okay. We're, we're a couple minutes early and it's being recorded, so we'll live in forever. Oh. Uh, welcome to today's uh, special edition where, of uh, Andrews University's chemistry seminar program. So we have hijacked the first about five or 10 minutes of our ChemSem program to do uh, commemorate a very important uh, event in the life of our department. So every year we have our um, quantitative analysis students who are gathered here in our chemistry amphitheater. Um, this is our big uh, sophomore and junior level chemistry class where the students blaze through and do all sorts of amazing things in lab. So the, the past chair of the department, Dr. Novak, um, categorized this class as where people become chemists in real life. Even if they're biochem majors, this is where their chemistry, uh, the chemistry part of the major comes from, I guess. Um, so it's a great class. And this year, we're uh, super excited to uh, honor the uh, students in our lab, uh, in the class, that are doing the lab part of it, we're honored to give them a, chem a lab coat that has been embroidered with their name and our official department logo. And it's a nice memento that we like to do for the students. We're super proud of the, the work that they do, the growth that they've shown, the growth that they're on the trajectory to do. So thank you guys for being awesome. They're sitting all the way at the back of the room, just like, just like in class. <laughs> So before we go any further, let's start out with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us together here. Um, thank you for each student that will be giving a lab coat today. Thank you for the talents you've given them, um, the skills that they're growing here at Andrews University um, to uh, further their understanding of the natural world and to further their opportunity to serve you by serving other people. Uh, God, I ask that you bless the students, uh, each student in a special way. It's a busy semester. It's a busy time of the semester. God, we pray that you will um, lift them up and give them uh, courage, emotional strength uh, to get through the, the coming days, the coming weeks. We know you can do this, and we pray this uh, encouragement and support for each student. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so without further ado... Uh, you guys, why don't you stand up and go on the edge so we can uh, go here. So the first the first student that we have, you guys get, get that up and stand outside, brother. Everyone's going to do it. So the first uh, lab coat that we have is for Zhang Wan Bei. So I will present you with your lab coat here. Congratulations, we're super proud of you. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. The next student is Che Hyun Kim. Congratulations, thank you, we're very proud of you. And we got a little bump here. All right, congratulations. They're gonna go put the coats on and we'll take a picture later. Uh, the next uh, lap coat is for Do Yoon Kim. I'll come back here. Congratulations. Very proud of you. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we're nearly with shake hands, but we cannot do this here. Uh, the next lab coat is for Owen Feiner. All right. Congratulations, Owen. We're proud of you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no problem. The next lab coat is for uh, Zoe Gentles. Zoe, we're proud of you. Ah, Zoe, so stop. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. The next lab coat is for Alyssa Henriquez. Yay. So did we do elbow bump? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We gotta make sure we do. Our next lab coat is for Julia Randall. All right, congratulations. All right, and the last lab coat is for Nels Wingsness. Woo! Go Nels! Yay! Awesome. Congratulations. 
<laughs> All right, super. All right, you guys get the lab coats, unbuttons and put them on the end of the alphabet. People always have to unbutton their coats extremely quickly. So super exciting. It's, we're glad to have our fall semester underway here. This is week five for us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, so, so next, when you get your lab coats on, sorry, come on down. And we'll, we'll take a picture of you guys, and then I will, all, uh, you guys as a group here, and then I will also join it. So we have a pretty far, so you guys, come on down, come on down, come on down. <laughs> you can take your socks off, your shoes off if this would make you feel better about the world. You can be in front. So maybe go in two rows, I think. Yeah, so a little so easier that way. Knowledge so. is on the edge, right there. So, mm -hmm. and then. You can see right there, it's like the, the screen is. Oh, that's awesome. You guys are some good looking future doctors. Proud of you guys. <laughs> Shout out. All right. Are you good? Shout out to Zoe. Another one, if you want. I'll, I'll hop in here and then we can be done. Okay. Okay. Zoe, can do it for each one. okay. All right. I will. I will get in front here. See, can I squeak in here? <laughs> See. No, you need Thank to go at the back. Okay, no. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, we're just going to okay. yeah. All right, sorry, guys. Okay. All right. <laughs> very good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And we were within six feet for, I think, less than. Uh, Way to go. Okay. We are, it's not a contract traceable event. <laughs> a, all right. So. So basically, that is the end of our quant lab coat ceremony, um, and we are now gonna, we can now return our uh, our time here to the um, regularly scheduled chemistry seminar. And we're very grateful to Dr. Murray, today's seminar speaker, for letting us use up a little bit of our uh, time. So actually, Alyssa uh, Henriquez, who is is one of our new lab coat wearers, is. Uh, um, was planning to introduce the speaker today. And so I will uh, turn the time over to her here. Come on up, Alyssa. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm here to introduce today's speaker, um, which is Professor Silvia Vignolini. Um, so Silvia Vignolini studied physics at the University of Florence, Italy. Uh, in 2009, she was awarded a PhD in solid state physics at the European Laboratory for Nonlinear Spectroscopy and the physics department at the University of Florence. In 2010, she moved to Cambridge as a postdoctoral research associate working in the Cavendish Laboratory and in the plant science department. In 2013, she started her independent research, becoming a BBSRC David Philip Fellow. Dr. Vignolini is currently a professor at the University of Cambridge in sustainability and bio-inspired materials. Thank you. Her research interest lies at the interface of chemistry, soft matter physics, optics, and biology. In particular, her research focuses on the study of how natural materials like cellulose are assembled into complex architectures within living organisms and how such materials can be exploited to fabricate a novel, a novel class of photonic pigments. Today, she will be speaking about natural photonic structures and their development, as well as recent advances to fabricate these photonic structures. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. Great, I don't know how you're gonna see me, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's a really nice uh, being with you and actually also sharing this uh, really nice moment. So I'm, I'm really glad that I've been given the opportunity. So I'm a bit, uh, when I accepted this seminar it was quite a while ago. Now I'm kind of, a uh, five months pregnant, so it's half past 10 in the evening. I'm kind of a bit tired. I hope that I would uh, be able still to manage to share the enthusiasm for, for what we do. And I hope that you would like the topic. And if you don't understand, 
please, uh, I think it's uh, feel free to interrupt me. Actually, I would be really happy if you interrupt me because I am essentially talking to my own computer. So if you have questions, please jump in and I would be able, happy, really happy to answer straight away. Okay, so we are going to talk about color and so let me just spend a few words on why color is actually a really important part of our life. As human, like any, any, many other animals, we use colored cue to communicate and to really, and, it, it, and it's part of our everyday, uh, not only technology, but I would say, but everyday life. In fact, if you look at this picture of a supermarket, you really see that the, the way that we engineer the appearance of object, uh, it's something that it's really well taught in our society because we are influenced by, by this, this color in our everyday choices. And it's not difficult, different from when we pick the clothes that we want to wear or when also we use makeup to, to make ourselves appear as something different. So color is an is extremely important form of communication. And in fact, like us that we produce colored material, but also in the living world, the optical appearance is something that it's uh, fundamental in, in many different species across every living uh, system from plants to insects, to even, uh, uh, to even bacteria and, and then obviously animals. And what we try to do as a chemistry department and chemistry lab, we try to understand what are the fundamental principles in terms of uh, uh, material science to understand how biomaterial interact into living organisms in order to obtain this appearance. I will explain in a moment uh, how. And we try to do it to understand nature and how natural structures are produced in order to make material with similar characteristics, but that are more sustainable because we aim to try to use as much as we can the same natural building block. So this talk, oops, I don't know why. So before I start this talk, let me just give you a, a quick slide of acknowledgement because I tend to talk too much. So maybe towards the end, I would, wouldn't have enough time of my group. So this is like all the, the things that I'm going to present are mainly led a lot from my, uh, the, my postdocs that really like, do a, an excellent job. And then the work of several different PhD students that are still in the group and other that have left because I'm, I'm showing you a little bit of an overview of everything that we do. So the outline is going to be, I'm going to explain you what is structural color because it's maybe not a topic that everyone is familiar with. And then I will give you some example of how this color are produced in nature. And uh, I, I think I, I picked uh, some of them that we work on and some of them from colleagues because I think are really, are really extremely interesting. And finally, I will show you some of the material that we do trying to take inspiration from nature. So structural color, when you look at an, an object like a mug or everything, also your clothes, what's happening It's the color it's often generated by, by pigment. So you have a, a material, a, chemi a, chemi a chemical uh, molecule or dyes that are absorbing part of the visible uh, light. And what is not absorbed is scattered back. So it's reflected back to your eye. And this is the color you perceive. So the main mechanism is absorption. So in order to change the color, you need, need, really need to change the type of material that you are using. In contrast, you can obtain different color trans by structuring transparent material. This sounds weird, but as you can see here, if you look at, if you think about a soap bubble, as soon as you, you make it out of water, water by itself is a transparent material. But as soon as you create this structure, this um, few hundred nanometers layer, you are able to interact with light with a phenomenon that is called interference, and then obtain this color out of a non-absorbing material. And what happens is that now, since the mechanism is different, this also the characteristic of the color that you obtain, it's, it's peculiar. And somehow, depending on the direction that you observe the object, the color change. And this effect is called iridescent. And this is like typical of the structural color. In nature, there are many, many different examples of how living organism structure 
material on the, on the order on the same scale of the wavelength of the light, similarly to the soap bubble, but they really build complex architecture to fully design the optical appearance. So let me give you some example. You, you can observe it in insects and mainly the material that uses uh, chitin or keratin in birds. You also have it in uh, animals that are not that far from us in the evolutionary tree, big baboons. They use collagen, that is the same material that we have in our skin in order to produce structural color. And we are mainly interested in plants. So for plants like, a bird, like um, flowers, leaves or, or even algae, structural color is often obtained by using polysaccharides. What is important for the production of color is this material that it's uh, called refractive index. I don't know if you have come across, but um, as, a, as a physicist, when you look at the refractive index in order to produce color, you, you might know that in order to be more efficient to interact with light, you would want to have this refractive index pretty high. And actually, generally what's happening is that uh, if you use inorganic material, you can obtain really high refractive index, but with organic material, polymer and biopolymer, generally it's not really easy to obtain high refractive index and so strong interaction with the light and matter. So it is surprising that nature can optimize the structure so much because you have to compensate for the lack of the ideal material, but nevertheless, you are able to obtain a structure and the optical appearance that are pretty, pretty impressive. Okay. So how, how do you optimize structure? There are different strategies to make color. So generally in nature, you, 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 you make color creating, as I was telling you, you need this interference effect. So you need, you need to create nanostructure. So think about this, every of these uh, spheres that you have in this slide, for example, let's look at the ordered case as a scattering element. So an element that can, can cause a reflection of light. If you arrange these scattering elements in periodic fashion, you can really build up this interference phenomenon. You can think about uh, many, many different layer of the soap bubble organized uh, uh, periodically in the space. And you can, and you can obtain the structural colored um, effect that are really angular independent. If you go, you can also have intermediate, intermediate correlation system that are polycrystalline, or short range correlation. I will show you a few examples in a moment where you can actually obtain the same structural color. You can obtain structural color because the, the scale is comparable with the wavelength of the light, but the color is much more uniform. It's less angular dependent. And finally, you can even make with, if when you use completely random uh, uh, structure, you can make white. If I have more, a moment, I will show you at the end of the talk. Not only nature plays with how to organize these scattering elements, but also plays with the with what you call hierarchical architecture. So the, the elements are structured periodically, for example, on, on the scale of a few hundreds nanometer, but then they are built up in even more complex structure at on the scale of few few tens of, of microns, because generally are organized inside living cell. So you can understand that also, again, playing with this hierarchical structure, you can really change even more the optical appearance. Let me give you some example. So when I say ordered structure, a good example is this uh, really nice uh, color of this bird. As you can see here, you actually see in these feathers, you can see all the different color from the rainbow, or from, from red to orange to yellow to green, and also almost ultraviolet. And as I was telling you before, this coloration, this structural color that it's really angular dependent comes from a layered structure of melanin that is inside the feathers, the barbels of this, uh, of this uh, bird's feathers. And this, you can see this layering that is of, on the order of few hundreds of nanometer periodicity that is comparable with the wavelength of the light is such that you can create this interference phenomena and similar to Bragg scattering, maybe you have done it in your course, so that you, if you, when you do X-ray diffraction, you know that the diffraction peak corresponds to different, uh, different angle, corresponds to different uh, uh, 
uh, to different uh, orientation of the crystal. This is really similar. It's a photonic crystal, it's not like a, a molecular crystal. So in the same way you can have this diffraction effect, so this, this uh, optical response in this case with, with visible light at different coloration depending on the angle that you look at it. Another interesting system is when you have still some correlation, but you start to have a little bit of disorder. This is called short range correlated structure because on the, on the large range, you don't have correlation between the different point. But if you go to look at one single scattering elements and you look at the neighbor around, more or less they have the same distance. And in the case of a one dimensional system, this could be done is done, for example, in the surface of structure of petals. So if you, this is like an SEM of a petal of a, a flower, which is called the hibiscus. And if you look at here, like in this picture, you see that you have this blue tint that is coming from the, the base of the petal. And this blue tint is essentially the results of this modulation of the cuticle of the, of the, of the flower petal itself. And these are TM images where you can see in cross section how the petal surface look like. So what is interesting in this is that if you, if you make replica that have the same amount of degree of disorder and you actually obtain in fact a correlated structure, you see that now the, how the color look in function of different angle is not anymore like as I was telling you before changing the color in function of the angle, so iridescent, but it's much more angular independence. And this is pretty, was pretty cool for us to discover because when we, had, when we went to do a little bit more digging and we started to analyze different flowers coming from different family in the entire phylogenetic tree with the with collaborator in, plant, in the plant science, Beverly Grover and uh, Edwish Morod, what we realized is that actually flower have converged to have an optimal amount of disorder to obtain this angular independent Q. And the reason why they do that is because they are more visible. They have done some uh, tests with, uh, with B really a behavioral experiment. And the reason why they do that is because the bees are much more fast in identifying this type of structural colored Q. So it was, was really, it was really cool that, to see that actually nature evolved in a direction where when you observe this correlated grating, you might think of it's a disordered structure. Actually, no, it's an, it's an optimized structure to provide a specific, a specific function, this angular, angular independent coloration. This angular independent color, you know, they are interesting, and, uh, but they are mainly used in nature to produce blue color. So this was like a really cool, uh, another cool founding that we, that we recently got it published uh, on PNAS uh, is that if you look at color produced by this uh, correlated structure in nature, you only find blue and UV cues, but you never observed red that is obtained with this type of color. And actually this was really, was really cool for us to see because if in, you try artificially with artificial material to reproduce this type of structure and scale them in order to also achieve different hues like green and red, the color, the red color that you obtain exploiting this uh, natural design, they are, uh, they are never really great. So somehow it seems that nature, again, it's like uh, <laughs> natural structure really are, uh, are optimized and then only, only for specific different type of color, you can you have uh, precise architecture. You cannot use uh, whatever you like. So this was uh, kind of nice. And um, as I said before, the extreme case, when you completely lose the periodicity and when you don't have any more correlation, you don't produce color anymore, but you produce another color that, uh, one color that is essentially is every color altogether that is white. And this is pretty nice and interesting because if you probably look around you, the world that, uh, that, uh, that uh, surround your, your room are mainly white. And uh, when you, if you have painted a wall, if you want to paint a wall white, but the previous color was uh, darker, 
you need to apply several layers of paint in order to cover what is underneath. And this is because we are not really good in making white paint. We use the titanium nanoparticle that are that have, as I was telling you before, a high refractive index so that it's they are inorganic material that can interact strongly with light. But what was really surprising, in fact, if you look at it in nature, white is not obtained with inorganic because you, if you are an insect, you cannot produce the uh, titania, but it's using a, a network of chitin and protein, but optimizing the characteristic of the network, creating this uh, random uh, network structure, these beetles are able to optimize and create perfectly opaque layer in only a few microns. What does it mean? It means if you compare with your layer of paint that in order to cover a wall, you would need at least 150 micron with only seven micron thickness. This, uh, this uh, beetles, it's able to, to make the same whiteness without the use of any inorganic. So it tells you that uh, actually this, this, this natural structure are pretty well, pretty well optimized. Okay. The other architecture that we mainly are interested in is this helicoidal one. What does it mean? It means, you know, if you have done a little bit of uh, material science in your, in your trimesters, in your previous uh, years, a good way to build material in nature is to use fiber reinforcement. Yeah. So if you have these fibers, you can the changing the dilationality in which you build up your fiber composite, you can improve the mechanical property. What is interesting is that if you use fiber that are birefringent, like in the case of cellulose, you can exploit similar architecture like this one, this helicoidal one, that are really good for mechanical strength, also for optical property. The only requirement that you have is that the periodicity here between layers that have the same orientation, again, is comparable with the wavelength of light. And uh, interestingly, in nature, you find both in the plants and in the animal world using polysaccharide fibri that, that comes in fibrils like cellulose and chitin that can be arranged into the silicoidal structure and produce coloration. So this blue of these berries that you can see in this first picture essentially it's not coming by any pigmentation. It comes from cellulose organized into this uh, helicoidal architecture. And this green of this petal is the same, comes from helicoidal architecture made of chitin. So for people that are not really familiar with this helicoidal architecture, what you see when you, when you take a cross section with electron microscope and you look at it in cross section, when you start to see this arc pattern, it tells you that it is called Bulligan pattern because Bulligan was the first one to observe it. And these are really common motif in nature also. Our bones often have this, this type of architecture because it's good for also for mechanical support. When in cross section, you see this arc pattern, it means that actually the fiber is like, I try to make a scheme here on the, on the left part of the screen. You see this fiber that are essentially twisting and this, again, when the, the twist is comparable with the wavelength of the light, you can, you can reflect coloration. I think uh, we mainly work with the cellulose type of structure. And uh, cellulose is particularly interesting because it's one of the most abundant material. And the way that cellulose is made in a cell wall is essentially at the cell membrane. So it's part of the of the cell wall of the plant that it's rigid because it contains cellulose. And you can think that plants don't have any skeleton like us. So they need material that are able to maintain the weight of the plant themselves. Think about how, how heavy a, a tree is. They can, they can reach up to a ton, right? So if you think about you have to maintain a ton, you already understand that this material, this fibrillar material, one of the main the main important component is the mechanical component. And in fact, these fibers are really special. They are composed by crystalline and amorphous part. And this crystalline part, if you want to have an idea of what is the mechanical response of the strength and the stiffness, are one of the most high 
uh, young modulus material that you can find with biopolymer. In fact, the, the, the young modulus is 120 gigapascal, which is pretty, which is pretty high if you think about that this polymer is essentially made out of sugar molecule, yeah? These are glucose. So, but the crystallinity, the packing is so efficient and the crystal structure is so good that in the crystalline area of this fiber, you obtain this really incredible mechanical properties. However, in natural fiber, you also have amorphous part. And this amorphous part, you might think, oh yes, because maybe nature is not good enough to make a, a material that is fully crystalline, like the material maybe you can do when you synthesize and you crystallize your, your molecule. No, that's not true. Actually, this amorphous part, they also have an important role in the plants because they make the fiber also mechanically able to reorient and survive stress. Because if you start to have a material that is highly crystalline, it's also become really, really brittle. And, um, you know, we, we work a lot on, from the biological point of view, try to understand the diversity of plants that use this trick, that use cellulose to, to produce uh, this uh, incredible optical effect. And as I was telling you before, this is another picture of this berry, which is called Margaritaria nobilis. The cellulose that is in this is the cell. You can really see that the, the skin is made out of a big cell and the cell, they have a really thick cell wall. And when you go to image the cell wall, you can actually with this SEM more clearly with the TM, the TM really observe this twisting of this fiber. So the, 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 the cell wall is only entirely made out of cellulose and the cellulose is essentially twisting layer on layer and interact it with light giving you blue. So obviously this is a little bit of a rhetorical question because I already told you that we try to make material in the same way. But uh, the idea is to really, can we exploit the cellulose to make optical structure in a similar way that plant can do it? And uh, the reason why we want to use specifically cellulose is because uh, it's one of the most abundant material that we have on the on the planet. This is the the market the market that you have of cellulose that comes from cotton, wood pulp, and uh, in and also like that goes into polymers. So, but it the, it's a really abundant material. We already use it, and it's one part of our society. And the other big advantage is that at the end, it's a material that is truly sustainable, edible and biocompatible. So when you think about to use it for, for pigment or make it color, it, at the end of the day, you don't, you don't have, a, you don't have a really nasty chemical in, in, uh, in, in, your, in, your, final, in your final pigmentation. Okay. And the way that I see when you look at the pigment industry, you know, there are no many alternatives that allow to have material that are not toxic, but at the same sustainable. There are many different pigments that are like natural, that can be extracted by plants or can be produced by bacteria. But from the point of view of sustainability, they are on long term, maybe they are not the best alternative. Instead, if, you, if we really could use the cellulose material to make the, the new generation of pigment, we could in principle also use cellulose that come from by agricultural waste, by, uh, uh, by textile, old textile and, uh, and paper manufacturing uh, material. So in fact, what I'm gonna show you from now on, it's all cellulose that is obtained from what is called cotton linters that are the part of the fiber that are too tiny to be interwoven in cotton textile. So this material generally is not used or is used as a lower quality material as a filler for a blanket or as a filler for like uh, for cloth for, for the winter when you, have, uh, when you have to put it is stuffing inside. So, but cannot be used nicely to produce a nice cotton yarn. Yes, because it's too short, but it's actually perfect for what we want to do for our cellulose nanocrystal. In fact, oops, sorry. In fact, what we want to do, we don't want to have the entire cellulose fiber. 
but we want to strip apart from the cellulose fiber this crystalline part that I was showing you before. So from, uh, from normal cellulose, from the same cellulose, you can take it from wood pulp, you can take it from an old newspaper if you purify the cellulose out, you can take it from cotton filter that you have in the lab. You uh, stuff it into uh, 65 uh, percent sulfuric acid in water, you degrade this amorphous part that are always present into the, into the natural plants, in, into the natural, sorry, uh, cellulose fiber, and then you isolate this crystal. And what is nice is that since they are isolated from with this hydrolysis condition, you, you are able to make them electrically charged. So they behave as colloidal particles. So I don't know if you have done a little bit of colloidal course, but when you have nanoparticles of the order of few hundreds of nanometers that are electrically uh, charged, so that you have a negative charge surrounding them, they can really maintain in suspension and be suspended. And what is nice is that in this system, they are colloidal particles, but they are liquid crystalline as well. So if you have a herd of, of, of molecular liquid crystal, we have the cellulose nanocrystal that we call them CNC are essentially a colloidal analog. There are nanoparticles that are charged, but when you put them in suspension and you increase the concentration, they start to interact and form what is called cholesteric, chiral pneumatic phase, where they form an architecture that it's actually really analogous of what I was showing you in the plant. So this is a little bit of a, I would say, not a full coincidence, but the, the mechanism that regulate the cellulose in the plants and the cell wall are completely different of what's happening here in a colloidal suspension. But the architecture is the same. And in fact, when you dry it out and you, can, you make a film out of it, this architecture can be maintained and you obtain color in the same in in, a, in exactly the same way that what you have in plants, using essentially the same material. So, just to give you a little bit of another slide to convince you, this is this this is a, an SEM picture cross section. Now, not anymore of the fruits, but if you re, if you recall the one that I show you a few slides ago, is essentially really analogous. Also, here you can really see this uh, small crystalline structure that essentially rotate and twist. And this twist is essentially coming from the orientation of this uh, cellulose nanocrystal that go layer by layer. And again, if the dimensionality it is right, you can change the, the coloration. So now we have worked quite a while with the system. So by, by changing the condition of the assembly, by adding uh, surfactant or salt inside, you can really change and screen this interaction because they are a colloidal system. And, and re in result, you can also change the color. So you can make color from blue to cyan to more green, yellow, orange, uh, and red. And in principle, you can even do ultraviolet and infrared. By playing a bit with the self-assembly, you can improve the alignment. You can also improve the mechanical property, make them uh, a little bit uh, um, bendable. We can change the, the response. And we have done several work really that try to study because I, I'm still a physicist. So we like to study the optical property. So we have done lots of different work to try to understand how can we control the orientation of this helicoidal structure inside the film and what can we understand from the self-assembly. So you comparing a bit si simulation and, and, opt and uh, results from optical simulation in the material that we fabricate. And one, why this is cool, I'll show you in a moment because this is, for example, it's a film, we call them cellulose holograms because this is a film that is cellulose and the color that you see here now when I wrote, when, you rotate, you kind of have the impression that, uh, you see, do you have kind of the impression that the structure that you are looking on the, on this glass slide is three-dimensional. And this is essentially an hologram, but it's an hologram that is simply obtained using only cellulose. The only things that we do, we are able to really change 
the orientation and the twisting angle of this helicoidal structure within the film. That's, that's the trick. And this is because, again, as I was explaining you before, it is a photonic structure, it's an ordered system. So if you change the orientation of the crystalline structure, in this case, the crystalline structure is an helicoidal one, you can change the color in, in terms of dimensionality on directionality. And this is essentially what holograms are doing. When you look at them at different color, you a different direction, you see different colors. So it gives you the impression of being a, a three-dimensional structure, even if it's only like a flat film. Okay, let's go back in what I was trying to tell you before is that a trick that nature used in order to fully control the optical appearance, for example, to make material that are angular independent, it's either you use disordered structure or you can play with the hierarchy. So I'll give you two examples of hierarchical structure of material that you can produce in the lab. So the first one is droplets. So, and actually, just to give you another example, when I say hierarchical structure, I mean, for example, the, the cell. This is another berry. And like the, the one that I was showing you before, the color is obtained by the cellulose uh, multilayer. But the cellulose multilayer are not in a flat, like in our case, in a flat film, but they are wrapped around the cell because that's the cell wall. So it's already in, since it's created inside a cell, it already has a, a level of hierarchy because you have the, the multi this helicoidal structure that has all the dimensionality of the order of few hundreds of nanometer. And then you, but this is inside a cell which has dimensionality of the order between 20 to 80 micron. So that's what I mean by hierarchy. So can we try to exploit and make the self assembly in the same way, try to confine it in a, in a spherical geometry? similar to what happens in the cell wall. And yeah, we can partially do it, not fully, because as you can see here, if you try to make droplets at a certain point, you will always have a little bit of collapse and buckling, but nevertheless, it's possible. So especially when you, you use microfluidic, you can control and force this self-assembly that can be actually properly modeled and experimentally we see the same. And as I was telling you before, while you are evaporating the water, you can maintain this type of structure, but you always have a little bit of buckling. And by controlling over how much you can buckle, essentially you can change the color. So removing completely the water will allow to obtain particles that are essentially blue. Then if you are swelling them a little bit, they go into green. And then if you are re even reintroducing water into the system, they can go into again to, to the red because you are essentially increasing the pitch, but these are the same particles. And we actually exploit this trick in making in exploiting what we what we call photonic pigments. In fact, these are like you know particles of cellulose that are dispersed in water. And as you can see, we can make them from blue to gray to green to red. And what is nice is that if you if you apply them as a coating on a surface. Since you have this hierarchical structure, again, and you look at different angles, so these are all pictures taken in different configuration by illuminating the sample at one angle and collecting on another one. But as you can see from the image, the color remains the same. So, and this tells you that actually, even if the structure is periodic and you would expect a change of uh, color, having this hierarchy allows you to get uh, this, uh, nice angular independent response. And this is completely different instead if you have a sessile droplet, if you have a mini film. In fact, here, as you can see, we can print again in different color. But now when you print, since you have a like a, the hierarchical structure is different, when you look it at a different angle, the color loop completely looks different. So if you have a film that is red and you change, you tilt it, it looks greenish. If you have a field that is green, it looks blue. And then again, if you have something that is blue, it goes into the ultraviolet. So you don't, you actually don't see it anymore. And this is because now, essentially the hierarchical structure, it's, it's only, it's like a film. So you have a layer 
you have a uniform layer of cellulose nanocrystal, so you don't see any modulation of color for this reason. And this is, it depends on the type of application we are working with, uh, with company to try to use it as pigment for, for ink. So inkjet printer. So this, this picture have been done with uh, not a commercial printer, but with like a uh, uh, printing methods that uh, de-wetting essentially. But this one are done with one of the commercial printed in inkjet that we use with this industrial collaborator. And as you can see, we can print nicely. And what is even nicer with the same, uh, with the same uh, material, we can print the entire rainbow coloration. We, the only things that we add here from going to red to blue is a little bit of salt. So we print, we change the salt uh, real time that is injected into the, your, into the inkjet printer with one cartridge. Essentially, you can make any different type of color that you want. And now we are really, really able to make them on large scale and we are trying to to try find application to, to really commercialize. So it seems a far fetch and you might think, ah, this is never gonna work outside the lab. It actually, it works. And because this material, the, the reason why we can work is because this material, it's really abundant. So we can, we can really fabricate it on large scale. And uh, yeah, one, and again, once we have them, we can try to, to use it as, as coating. You can do similar things with the chitin. I'm, I'm talking too much, so I will not have time to go into through this, but I just to, wanted to give you an idea. And then at, first, at last, but I think not least, I want to give you another little bit of flavor of a little bit more what else can you do when you think about uh, biomimicking and, uh, and material. So what I show you so far are colors that are static. So this color, once they are made, they don't change anymore. But what I like of, of nature is that you find a myriad of example of dynamic coloration of color that change and responds to the environment. And this is pretty crazy. So if you look at this video, it's, I think it's one of the, of the nicest example, this squid, that it's able to mimic and change these patterns and they use it for camouflage, but also they use it for many different other functions. Yeah. So this is not even one of the most uh, colorful one. So how is it, would it be possible to make material again that responds simultaneously with the stimuli? So some polysaccharides can do, and one of the nice one, it's actually a material that you probably have already eaten in your life if you ever had an aspirin and this hydroxypropyl cellulose. So this is a cellulose derivative. I'm sure you have, you have it in the chemistry lab somewhere and it's used, it's really like exploited in the pharmaceutical industry for making tablets as a, as a, as a template for, for grafting uh, the, the drug uh, molecule. But not many one knows that actually it's also a liquid crystalline polymer. So it has the, the, the chain, but you also have hydroxyl group that are attaching one of this uh, on the hydroxyl group of the cellulose. And, uh, and I was telling you this can be responsive because for example, if you laminate it between two, two different uh, layer, you can compress the mesophase and the mesophase will automatically change color. So this is, these are like, this is like a liquid crystal that if you compress it changes color, but also similar, similar maybe you haven't seen this, uh, I think maybe you are too young, but the one of my age might, they might have, uh, re might remember this mood ring that they had, that they were having uh, not too many years ago. And this mood ring are like essentially liquid crystal, but uh, uh, liquid crystalline molecule that they change color just because of the same mechanism, but with a temperature and actually, also hydroxypropyl cellulose has this behavior of thermotropic properties. So the same similar uh, color change can be obtained by a mechanical stimuli also by a thermal stimuli. So they can be used as, if you want as thermometer or as a mechanical response. And again, I want to stress you out that this material is edible. So this one is not what we have in the lab. This is also me proving that is actually it's true. And these are pictures taken at different uh, Christmas dinners, as you can see, you know, the, the, the material, it's, it's really simple. You just mix 
60% 60, 60 in weight HPC and the rest is water and you let it, you, you stir it, it's really annoying because it's super sticky and tacky, but then you let it uh, rest that, they, they, you, that you don't trap too many, too, many, uh, too many air bubble inside. And once you have it, if you have a planet centrifuge, that's the best thing to, you can use to, to mix it. But once you have it, you will see that the color appears as a magic. And the reason that it appears is you have, again, this helicoidal architecture that are responsible of structural color. So I don't have time for this, but I think I would just want to give you a little bit on an idea. So I think this is an interesting topic and we need, uh, in my opinion, more chemists getting passionate about this because I, I really believe that we can make materials sustainably exploiting these uh, polysaccharides and other components from, we mainly are focused on biomass, on plants biomass, but you can think about many other different systems. You can really try to exploit new technique of assembly like self-assembly, but also this could also be additive manufacturing and, and taking real inspiration from nature on how structure this material on the nano and macro scale so that you can really exploit uh, them to produce material for in a more sustainable way using the circular economy approach and more green chemistry and then to reduce the amount of waste and then essentially also you can this material that we want to exploit can also come from the waste itself because at the end uh, th there are already they are already much available in our everyday biomass. So I hope that I convince you that this is uh, possible. We do this in the context of, of plants. As I was telling you, we use lots of, uh, lots of paper, sorts of cellulose that comes from, uh, from uh, paper industry. And now we are also actually working with, uh, with uh, cellulose that come from bandages because often piece of uh, bandages are cut, the bandages are cut, and then you have a lot of wasted uh, cellulose that is actually really good quality, cellulose one, or also cellulose that come from skin of coffee skin or grape skin, and you can make nanocrystal also with this material. And then we really try again to use technique, like as I show you, or to roll or printing additive, what you call additive manufacturing in order to make uh, bio-inspired material, we work with optics, but you can make many more. And we, and we are at the point is that now that once you can make a reasonable amount, you can really start to collaborate with industry and, and actually see if they are interested and if they can, if they can really exploit it uh, from, uh, from a really commercial point of view and, and assess also what is the, at the end, the final impact. So I hope that I convince you and I, didn't bore you too much to this today. And if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so this has been fascinating to me, um, very much so. Um, like you said at the beginning, it was at least a year or so that we invited you, then Corona hit. Um, and so that was the reason why we couldn't have had uh, this lecture before. So yeah, the, an the anticipation itself, <laughs> at least for me, was already there. Um, I have a question to begin with. Sure. I have several questions, but I'll also have our students um, uh, ask their own questions as well. Sure. So um, have you come across, because it sounded like in the case of that bird that had basically all the colors of the rainbow, is that a case where it's a combination of pigment and structural? Is that? No, no, this is comes because of the, this comes because of, uh, of it's a consequence of the type of structural color that you have. So essentially similar to when you do, I think that for, for the, the best example to think about if you have experience with X-ray, X-ray diffraction, right? Mm -hmm. You have your crystal, you look at the crystal from different angle and the peak 
that you observe in your X-ray spectra will, will shift. Because, it, because if you look at different angle, the periodicity of the crystal is different. Mm -hmm. This is the, it is the same for light. So you have a periodic structure, in this case, this multi-layer. When you illuminate it from one direction, you see one periodicity. So it reflects one specific color, let's say red. And when you change, sorry, let, when you change, I would say blue actually. And when you change the angle of incidence, so you increase it, the periodicity that you see is slightly different because it's larger. So the color that is reflected is red. That's why, and in this case, it's a picture, but uh, actually the different uh, feathers are slightly oriented in slightly different direction. So when you look it from one angle, you are seeing a different direction that comes from different feathers at the same time. So you see this effect of, uh, of rainbow effect. But it's also important to say that, uh, you know, you have structural, the, the, the effect of color comes from the structure, but you also have the effect of absorption right. that comes from the, that comes from the, from the melanin pigment. Right. So the, but the melanin is like black. So what it means, it means that uh, despite you use something absorbing, you are modulating the refractive index enough in such a way that you can still get uh, reflection. So it's uh, in, in nature, structural color is often, if not always, combined to pigmentation. But uh, the color that you see is not because uh, different feathers have different pigment. It's just it's the photonic structure themselves. So the structure is exactly the same. You're just looking at it from different angle. So, so that applies, that same principle applies to butterflies, for example. Yes. OK. All right. So yes, but ask... butterfly, the most famous butterfly, like this, uh, this, uh, this, for example, this uh, morpho butterfly that it's blue. Mm -hmm. In this case, you have a photonic structure that is obtained without pigment. Mm -hmm. And but you have a layer underneath so you have that two scales. So you have one scale on the top that has the photonic structure, and then you have a second scale underneath that is what gives you the pigment. Okay, okay. Because you, you combine it to, to give color depth. Okay. Essentially. All right, so let's um, have a question. Let's see, Joshua Pack, Pack is still on. Um, you have a question, could you go ahead and Unmute yourself and ask your question, Joshua. Sure. Um, thank you for giving this talk, by the way. Um, I was wondering what the cons of producing um, your color in this manner is. Like, what are they compared to the current industry methods? Um, okay. So you. So I think the the biggest goal is like the green chemistry, right? Like it's uh, like environmentally sustainable, but. Um, uh, like, what are the shortcomings of this method? The shortcomings, if you want, is the fact that uh, it's not an industrialized. Uh, so you need to come, depends on with what you compare it, okay? You can, if you compare it with the pigment industry, it's completely, it's completely different. These are like batch chemistry and you don't have, uh, if you want, uh, any type of, uh, let's say, it's really difficult to make a comparison. Generally, you, the type of material that you need in order to obtain pigment and dyes are generally pretty nasty chemical processes. They are not the most, they are really difficult to improve and make them more green. Mm -hmm. So this is the first is the sustainability aspect that it's the first comparison. Obviously, if you look in terms of scale, these type of systems are much more complicated because it's not that you synthesize the building block, but you actually extract building block from, from a natural resource. So you have to purify, for example, if you start from, from wood, you have to purify the cellulose, or if you start from cotton, you don't have to do purification, but you still have to do the, 
you still have to do the hydrolysis. There are also more green way to do the hydrolysis, not only with the sulfuric acid hydrolysis, there are other way that still works. So that there are more green method, but nevertheless, you have to do this step. And then you have the second step that it would be the assembly. But if you compare it with the actually uh, equivalent in the in the pigment industry, this would be that this the the pigment that we that we make with structural color would be called uh, you would call them uh, in uh, effect pigments, mm. and the effect pigments that you have done that you have today, like here we 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 propose to use the cellulose to make them so to have something like. Uh, like this one that are 100 cellulose obviously in order to reach that we need to make the cellulose nanocrystal make them assemble assemble them into droplets so it's, it's, it's complicated but when you what they do now and what is industrialized is that people in basf or merck mm -hmm. they get mica they fractionate mica of specific size so that they get it in suspension and then they deposit by electro deposition layer by layer other inorganic material on top of each other in order to create this multi layer structure that gives you the color so now it's uh, if you before like if you think uh, maybe you don't remember but if like several years ago like 10 15 years ago if you wanted to buy a car that has this metallized paint you were paying more, especially because this paint, it was an expensive process to, to make. So obviously costs are not optimized because these are like products that we can make in the lab. We can make it on a reasonable large, large scale, but to have, to have a proof of concept, to have like a full uh, chemical plant that is able to make this, uh, this material, it's a completely different things, but you know, you need to start somewhere and then maybe you can grow. But the shortcoming at the moment are really like trying to scale up the process. That's that is, is scaled, but to a scale that is not comparable with the market of cellulose manufacturer that you would need. Yeah. So that's the main that's the main problem. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> so Isabella has a question similar, um, you know, but different. So Isabella, you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, so I was wondering, is the isolation of cellulose a long process? And I think you already answered, um, but also is it environmentally friendly? So the way we do it, I would say that it's not really environmentally friendly just because we are starting now to use so other people have published method that where they produce good cellulose nanocrystal that they, that I think would work for what we want to do using, for example, ionic leafy or tipeotectic solvents. So you can really then and there you can do recycling of these ionic liquids, for example, during the manufacturing process and obtain the same similar performing material. So I think that like in short, I think in, in what we do us, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't categorize as green chemistry. We end up having a material that is, in my opinion, more sustainable than a plastic because at the end it's still a biopolymer, but the hydrolysis process, it's really not, uh, it's not really green. In, com in pilot plants that are, because these are also produced uh, on, uh, the large scale, large area material we have used, we have collaborated with, with the CNC supplier. So there are some plants that produce them with this acid hydraulic technique. They recycle the acid to a certain extent, but uh, it's really, you need to bleed, you need to quench the reaction with lots of water. So you, you, have, a, you have an intense use of water. So it's not a really green chemistry, yeah? So, but there are ways to improve it. And I think, uh, I think that I have the responsibility that we should try to start to use them as well, but a little bit for laziness and a little bit because in the lab, when you have something that works, you tend not to change it. We <laughs> stick with our recipe of preparing the material, but there are, 
there are ways to make them that I think they have the same potential. Okay. Uh, Aaron, you want to ask you a question? It's also related to the processing of the cellulose. Yeah. Aaron? Yeah, so um, I was looking at that. You know, in one of your slides, you had a um, you had sulfuric acid reacting with the cellulose. Yeah. That was at like 64% weight, which actually I miscalculated. It's like, that's like 12 molar, which yeah. is insanely acidic. Um, yeah. So, um, you can imagine, you know, I think in my opinion, it's pretty impressive that he's not digesting the cellulose because we yeah. also have 60, we have, we have it at 60 degree. Yeah, it's 30 yeah. minutes, but we have it at 60 degree. So, the, um, so between 64 and 62% these are actually the value that we use. Uh, you have the solubility of the cellulose chain and then the and, uh, um, mono disaccharides or, po or po shorter polysaccharides, it's different. So mm -hmm. we, we, what we do, we, you use the hydrolysis in such a way that then you start to make soluble this amorphous part and then they partially degrade. So you do, you solubilize and degrade and then the, what you have to do at the end is, uh, especially because you have all this, this, uh, this acid, we generally use a tenfold uh, uh, dilution with, the, with the, the eye water to interrupt the reaction. So to make sure that we can control it well. And we also use it this under like, obviously in a, in a nice bath. Eh? Mm -hmm. So that we can that we can uh, that we can then really quench the reaction almost instantaneously because we might have problem of redeposition of the of this uh, partially solubilized chain into the whole loid and then it's really difficult to take them apart. But uh, yes, this is like it's a pretty harsh uh, acid uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so then. Um, after you purify it, I mean, there's got to be some waste from that. And I, I mean, I can't imagine that you use all of the sulfuric acid in the reaction. So what do you do with that waste? I mean, you kind of mentioned this before that your process isn't entirely green. Is this, no, 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 how no, do you dispose of that? It's and not green at all. In the way that we make it in the lab is not green at all. The, the people that make them, uh, the people that make it, uh, for example, with, uh, in these plants, I know that they have way to recycle the, the acid. And uh, in fact, also the property of the crystal that we get from them are different and we have to do some extra treatment in order to, to get into what we like. But, um, but uh, they don't quench, they centrifuge. So in order to, you know, so I don't know if they, it's difficult to understand from them what are the exact uh, process because they try to keep them also secret. But uh, I know that they can recycle partially at least the sulfuric acid that they've used during the hydrolysis. There are ways, there are other ways, as I was telling you, if you want to make it a little bit more green that, uh, that are much better. And, that, and, I, and I, but we haven't used them yet because as I said, when we started, uh, these things came up a bit uh, later, if you want. When we started, we, we, I worked with a, a person that actually came from uh, a, a lab, a Grenoble, that they were already working with the system that uh, have, they had optimized the recipe. And it wasn't, uh, because it's simple, but it's, there are like, you know, there are some details that doesn't make it trivial. Once you know it's easy, but to this to do it by yourself is not that straightforward to get to get it into the right the right condition. But yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, Anaya. Anaya, you want to ask your question? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I really appreciated the presentation. It was very informative. I was wondering. Um, the durability of the pigments of the um, 
the comments that you guys form, the colors that you guys form. Um, how is it compared to that of those that we use today? That is to say, like, how hard would it be to degrade the cellulose, the hierarchical structure of the cellulose that would cause the color to change and such? Yeah, I think it is. So in terms of, depends on what you look at. So if you look in terms of bleaching, it's really, it's much better because it not being a chemical process, it doesn't degrade. The cellulose has a really, really low absorption in the UV. So also in terms of UV stability, it's, it's, it's good. Once you remove the, this group, sulfuric, uh, sulfur ester group, you, for example, also doing a basic treatment post assembly, or for example, uh, a slightly heat treatment, you might modify a little bit uh, the crystalline structure, but you can also make the structure somehow hydrophobic. So that they can be to a certain extent water resistor too. Obviously, if you compost them, if you mix them to compost, they would, you would then get enzyme that naturally degrade them. So they would degrade, you would, you would not find them. So you have to compare this with the normal pigment. If you have normal pigment as well, they embed them into matrices, what you call binders. So if you use a binder that is essentially plasticizers or mixture of different resins, then the, the final durability of your coating, it's evaluated also in presence of the binder. So as a peak them, themselves, they are pretty good because they are really thermal, highly thermally stable because being only the crystalline part of the cellulose, the thermal degradation, it's uh, around uh, 250 degree. So they're, they're really like, you know, we have used with some collaborator uh, hot, uh, hot embossing and uh, we were heating them up up to 100 degree to embed them in uh, polyurethane films and the color was maintained. So it is, uh, it is uh, pretty cool. You have a little bit of, they become a bit brownish above 100 degree if you keep them for long because you have a little bit of caramelization essentially happening. It's it, the end is sugar. But, uh, but in the, the, the other characteristics are pretty good. So you can, I wouldn't see any problem if you put them in a normal binder, they would last as the titanium nanoxide pigment in terms of outside durability, yeah? As it by themselves, no, because at a certain point there would be the problem that we have seen at the beginning, it's funny, our our film were becoming moldy because we weren't treating them. Uh, we were like, you know, bacteria then start to act. And then since they are like uh, the suspension, they were becoming moldy because the bacteria were growing inside. Oh, okay. If you don't, and then we, we started to learn to put like some, uh, some like one drop of chloroform for for two liters of, of, of CNC and then, it were, then they were fine. But at the beginning we get to get them moldy. So it tells you that microorganisms, they, they digest them. Okay. So for the last two questions, these are sort of like light hearted more, I would describe them. Nick and then Jasmine. Nick, go ahead and ask your question. Nick there. Maybe unmute yourself. You got to unmute yourself, Nick. I think he's saying he has a lot of background noise. OK, well, I'll ask his question for him. Nick is asking you, um, what is the most fascinating color you have seen? And what is your favorite color? OK. <laughs> So I have to be biased. The, the most fascinating <laughs> color that I ever seen uh, that I, when I was, uh, it was when I started this, it was this uh, fruits. Okay. Because it, because it was, it's so this, this blue, if you want. It was pretty cool because when the first time that I saw that were, we were told to check uh, 
we were told to that these fruits might be something interesting to study by another colleague that is also a plant scientist. These fruits they grow in East Asia, in Africa, so we didn't have access to like you know to plants that they were growing nearby in the UK to just uh, just get them right. Mm -hmm. So, but then they had some sample at the Hugh Botanical Garden. So we went to the Hugh Botanical Garden and they have an herbarium. So where they keep all these plants in the books. And it was for me before the, it was the first time, it was pretty cool. So we went to check and then they have like all these uh, historical records and then we opened them. And actually this was like, uh, this is a picture of one of them maintained inside a, inside a, you know inside a, like a, a vial a glass vial hmm. and both the one like closed in the book and the one in the vial they were like 150 years old and they were still like like this as you see it in the picture wow. Wow. so we were like whoa this is must be this must be really like cool yes <laughs> it's true so the mat they cannot be pigment because they also the color of the leaves they were completely faded Mm -hmm. So we would say that was for sure structural color. So that's why we were really like, this one was one of the moments that you say, actually, this is pretty cool. Yes, it is. So Jasmine. Jasmine, are you there? Okay, if she isn't, I'll ask a question. This is the last question. Um, unless somebody has a burning question. Anyway, are these colors safe for artists to use in paintings and other forms of artwork? Yes, we are now giving them to to a certain extent because you, we need to make them. So we, we cannot <laughs> really give it to everyone, but we are also training some designer to use it and to make the suspension, especially now that there are some the commercial one. And we hope that people actually use them a little bit more to make uh, to make uh, uh, to make uh, like you know also to raise awareness on the fact that they exist and I think this is the first uh, the first step and uh, if we give them without having too much problem because at the end they are you know they are safe so it's uh, it's uh, you need well, the only things that you need to know is to need to how to properly handle at the end a suspension because they are colloidally stable and then if you start to mix it with other stuff, you might ruin the suspension and then the self-assembly is not as nice as it is. So that's why you need a little bit of training, but then once you have that, uh, and it's actually surprising to see how artists uh, really, they are artisan and they really know how to work with the hands and really know how to, you know, they are, they are somehow sort of a bit of a, chemist uh, themselves uh, because they really know that, that that is important how you mix the things and when what to use how how to do it so i think it, it's just question of training they already have the mindset that for the fact that specific material needs to be manipulated in a specific yes. way so it's not that it's not that difficult for 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 the people at least we have interacted with okay well uh professor vignoli you have lived up to the hype that was in my okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad. So I was glad that we... I was looking forward to this talk and uh, you fulfilled that completely. And I'm pretty sure that uh, for all of us here, faculty, staff, and students, this was a good one as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for again for the invitation and again. Have a good rest of the day. What time is it there? Now it's quarter to 11. Okay. All right. You deserve your rest. <laughs> I deserve to go to bed now. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Bye. Have a good, uh, good rest of the day. Thank you again for the invitation. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> bye.